father as the ambassador rode out there. And my mother, myself, and my younger brother went with him. And we were there, watched them come parade past in front of Ras Tafri, who was later to be the Emperor Haile Selassie. <laughs> an unbelievable sight. The chiefs were dressed in their magnificent robes and with their lion's main headdresses and their shield ornamented with gold or silver. And so the whole time there was the thunder of the war drums and the blare of the trumpets and then countless banners floating above them. And then the footmen coming along dancing and the minstrel and all of them waving their swords and uh, shouting out what they'd done. It is something which uh, made an enormous impression on me. I think that probably decided my life. On May the 5th, 1936, the Italian troops of Marshal Badoglio entered Addis Ababa, bombing, machine gunning, and gassing this country into submission. Goliath had won the first round. Over this countryside for five years, he sent out his punitive columns to keep his Philistinian peace. But the revolt went on, against the dizzy background of the Abyssinian mountains, where the people waited in extraordinary confidence for the day when their own monarchy should return and the tyrant's flag should be pulled down. Four years later, an aircraft unknown to the Abyssinian came over the western horizon. It dropped no bombs. Sheaves of yellow paper fluttered through the upland sunlight down to the plateau. They were stamped with the seal of the Lion of Judah, Haile Selassie I. My beloved people, they read, I rejoice to announce to you that I am once again among you. I have come with the invincible might of Britain. This verse from the Psalms of David is the watchword of our revolt. Ethiopia raises her hands towards God. Drums beat out the signal. Ethiopia raises her hands from tableland to tableland. Messengers, servants of the great chiefs of Ethiopia, who in many provinces had not submitted to the Italians, spread the news also to the villages. And the Ethiopians pulled out the old rifles that had lain in the thatch of their houses when the Italian police passed through. They saddled their horses and mules, harnessed them in the fierce bits of war and hurried to the chieftain's camp. This was the Abyssinian mobilization, the formation of the famous Patriot Army in its rags and its bare feet, which struck such fear into the Italians and crumbled their resistance behind the battle. Where at Keren and on the Juba River, in Asmara and Harar, the British regular war machine was pounding their weary troops. And this is the headquarters of the man who, at his Empress command, held up the flag of Ethiopian liberty for five years. Ras Ababa Aragai, in 1935 and 1936, chief of the Addis Ababa police. A quiet, astute, gentle-voiced officer, incapable of shouting duce duce in any language. One of the bravest men in the modern world. Ababa Aragai has spent the past five years never more than a hundred miles from Addis Ababa. With a price on his head, He's been wounded in battle half a dozen times. He's foiled more than one Italian expedition of 15,000 men. And now the promised arms are coming. British rifles with British bands, all sorts, Martinis, Lee Metfords, Lee Enfields, and American rifles, Springfields. It was a chance shipment from America that gave the first armed impetus to the revolt and captured Italian rifles in their thousands. Last lessons in guerrilla warfare from the Ras Ababa Araka. Don't be foolish, he says, as many of you were in 1935 and 1936. Don't go en masse in front of their machine guns. In five years, we've learned a lesson or two in mountain fighting, the night attack, the war of nerves, and of unnerving shrieks in the dark, the war of light hand grenades stolen from the Italians, the attack on the flank, the ambush from the stone sand. That long hair on your heads is the badge of the Arbenya, the Ethiopian guerrilla fighter. 
It is the outward sign of your form as a regular soldier. Now into the lorries, troops, rifles, bayonets, provisions and all. And we'll show the Italians what we mean by Ethiopian independence. The Patriot armies whip up their arms, food and drink. Beer made of Abyssinian bark, called Tala. And mead made of Abyssinian honey, called Cage. Meanwhile, the Ras gives orders to his staff. The women bring small sacks of millet to cook cakes and the dried peas called shimbala that are Ethiopia's hardest rations. The women and the children are going to battle with the men. The little boy carries his father's rifle until the moment when father thinks that he can draw a bead on an eye tie. If father dies, then the rifle belongs to the little boy. Mother and son will give father a good Christian burial on the battlefield. They're sterile, but they're optimistic also. Perhaps, they think, it'll be the Italian who will lie stiff under our independent African stars. And then we'll have another rifle in the family for little brother to carry. This is the great seal of the realm. Around, in Amharic letters, are the titles of imperial authority. Haile Selassie I, King of the Kings of Ethiopia, Elector of God, the Lion of Judah has conquered. It is the proof that the Emperor, the seed of Solomon and of Sheba, has returned to take up his whole people in his hand. The Emperor Haile Selassie has crossed the great trench of the Blue Nile with two regular battalions of Sudanese and Ethiopians, with a cloud of patriots on either flank, with British officers whose daring ranks with that of Lawrence. Without one piece of artillery or one tank, he has defeated and demoralized the 30,000 Italian troops who held the western province of Gojam. He is 100 miles from Addis Ababa, into which the victorious army of General Cunningham has driven. The emperor has come to feature. He is near Deborah Libanus, one of the holy places of central Ethiopia, where the Italians in 1937 machine gunned to death 400 Ethiopian monks and chucked them into a common grave, where also his cousins, the sons of his principal Ras, Kassa, were executed by the Italians in the same year. His field commander is at his right hand, and on his left is the new British commander of his bodyguard. This is the heart of Christian Ethiopia, that island of Christianity, as the Emperor Menelik expressed it, in a sea of paganism for 1,500 years. And the Emperor, installed upon his throne, is head of the Ethiopian Coptic Church and superintends its ritual. Not greatly like our Christianity, you may say. The priests wear turbans and process under umbrellas with their silver top dancing sticks in their hands and their silver musical instruments that tap out the harsh refrain of the Coptic Psalms. The Psalms of David, the music and the rhythm of David himself as he danced before the Ark of the Covenant. These are as much a part of the Ethiopian church as is the New Testament. A touch of the modern world. An English wireless operator takes down a message from the British command in Addis Ababa. It's an important message. It means the collapse of the Italian resistance in Ethiopia. It's good news to the head of the British military mission to Abyssinia, who at nearly 60 years of age entered Abyssinia almost single-handed in August 1940, and hunted by the Italians, laid all the staff work for the revolt. Meanwhile, Ras Ababa rides at the head of his army to join his emperor. Dessier has fallen. The Duke of Aosta is in flight. We have captured more than 40 boxes of his personal baggage. Italian prestige will never stand up to this shock at the top. And so the road to Addis Ababa is open, except for a demoralized force of Italians in the valley ahead that the Emperor and his commander in the field will have to bypass or drive through. From Addis Ababa comes General Cunning, brother of the officer commanding the Mediterranean fleet, who by his staggering advance from Kenya to Mogadishu, Mogadishu to Harar, Harar to Addis Ababa, has set up new records in military speed and has shattered armies numerically three times as strong as his own. This is the first time that the Emperor and the General have met, and it is the first junction of the forces from the Sudan and from Kenya.
first steps, a guard of honor from the Nigerian regiment awaits the emperor. And General Cunningham is there with the officers of his military administration. Patriots won this war, leaped together on the palace steps of Addis Ababa. While 30,000 Abyssinians crammed the streets outside, shouting and throwing flowers, kissing the ground, waving the Abyssinian flag. To them, the Emperor says, be Christian and kind-hearted to our defeated enemy, the Italian, and do not treat him as he treated you. So, in five years, the whirligig of time, often slow in motion, has brought its full revenge. It was revenge the word. The Italians are safe. No one molests them. All the world disregards them. Somehow or other, the Ethiopians push the horrible memory of the 9,000 massacred in February 1937 to the back of their minds. The whirligig of time has brought its justice rather than its revenge. The so-called barbarians, the cruel people of Italian legend, has taught the so-called civilized fascist a lesson in forbearance, decency, and dignity. At his palace, the emperor receives the patriot troops of Ras Ababa Araka, who boasts before him in the customary cockwalk pukala of the Ethiopian fighting man. Each and all want to tell the emperor of his glorious deeds. How many Italian officers he killed, how many machine guns he took single-handed, how he is his emperor's devoted servant, to be sent to fight the battles of Ethiopia wherever his emperor desires. Then there is the quiet, serious voice of Ababa Aragai. Your Majesty, I never hope to see the son of your face again in Ethiopia. I never dreamed that I would once more be happy. I was only determined to fight until I died for our independence, for our flag, for our Christian religion, and for you, my king. England and Ethiopia have a common link in St. George. He is their patron saint as well as ours. Five years ago, as the black shirts marched into Addis Ababa, the priests of the Coptic Cathedral have smuggled out of the town the Ark of the Covenant of St. George. It is a famous ark throughout Ethiopia. It is the ark of the national consciousness and of self-defense against aggression. It was with Menelik when he defeated the Italians at Adowa in 1896. It was with Ras Ababa Aragai throughout the Italian occupation. On a cold morning in Addis Ababa, it came back to the cathedral with the emperor and was put once more with hymns and sacred dance in the Holy of Holies. It was a cold morning, and it rained. But a right was restored on that day, and the chains were struck off the wrists of a whole people. On the main road from Djibouti to Addis Ababa stands Diradawa, another name that brought glory to the imperial forces. Before the oncoming troops, the entire population fled to the capital, and today Diradawa is deserted, a town of ghosts. The railway station here is an important one and a military objective that the Allied bombers didn't miss. The railway workshops too came out badly against the onslaught of the men in the air. Over the aerodrome flies a Savoia 79, but it carries no threat of battle. It brings an envoy from the Duke of Aosta, the Viceroy of Italian East Africa, and he comes to plead for the safety of the civilian population of Addis Ababa. Meanwhile, where the troops are concerned, all roads lead to Addis Ababa, and this is the big push, and their pace never slackens. Once a proud highway of Mussolini's Africa, this road is now a sad story of broken bridges. The Italians' last attempt to stem the Allied advance, but they forgot the sappers. If a bridge can't be repaired, another is built in its place.
mind, it has got to be able to take it. The lorries and armoured cars it has to carry are not exactly perambulators. At a wash, a complete new bridge had to be thrown over the river. There it is, a monument to the skill and efficiency of the South African engineers. One of the sorriest wrecks is the railway bridge at Awash. Stretched over a ravine 200 feet deep, the Italians built it to last as long as their empire. Well, it did. All set for the last push, on to the capital. It's easy to get there now. They just follow the white flags. The land forces move quickly, but the Air Force beats them to it. South African Air Force bombers were early callers at this Addis Ababa aerodrome, and after their visit, the resident Capronis, Fiats and Savoyas were a little uh, obsolete. Here's another Italian biting the dust. The bombers of the Imperial Air Forces were a smashing success. At last, headed by music strange indeed to the Abyssinians, the Imperial troops enter Addis Ababa. Escorted by a squad of Italian motorcycle police, the general officer commanding drives to the Viceroy's palace to accept the surrender of the city. Addis Ababa became the capital of Abyssinia in 1896 and it has been under Italian rule for the last five years. But all that is ended now. It regains its freedom as the colors of tyranny are hauled down to make way for the standard of liberty. The Italian Guard of Honor salutes the new regime. The fall of Addis Ababa does not quite mean the end of the Abyssinian campaign, but it's a good step towards it. This is a proud day for those who are leading this campaign to its victorious conclusion. From the Viceroy's palace, the general officer commanding goes to the hall of battle to read the official proclamation to the Abyssinian chiefs. This is the moment they have waited for. The oppressor's yoke is up and the chief city of their land can raise its head. The flag flies again. The long-awaited day has at last arrived. The emperor returns to his capital. Ahead of him ride and march his victorious patriot troops. High tribute has been paid to these men for their courage and endurance in action and under the hardship of long marches. The emperor in his car moves forward through the approaches to the city lined with hundreds of his joyful subjects. For them, freedom is riding in that car, with Haile Selassie as its symbol. For five years they have suffered under the Italian invader. For five years the fascists have systematically hunted down and exterminated those young Abyssinians who had set themselves to the task of civilizing and emancipating their country. The conquerors have been swept away, and with them has gone tyranny and suppression. Arrived in the city, the emperor is greeted by the general officer commanding. From the steps of the palace, he makes his first address to the people of the Ethiopian capital. On the anniversary of the day when five years ago he was forced to fly from the Italian aggressor, 
the Negus places himself once more at the head of his people. Their independence is safe, but Haile Selassie knows full well the great task that lies before him. But in his hands and with the assistance of Britain, the reconstruction of his country is assured. Abyssinia lives again. Addis Ababa, capital city of the Ethiopian Empire, and the scene recently of an historic event. Here in this room on the 29th of January of this year, an agreement was ratified between Great Britain and Ethiopia. It was more than just a document which was signed on that day by the Emperor Haile Selassie and Major General Sir Philip Mitchell. It was the first example of the redeeming of a solemn pledge, the pledge given by the democracies to fight for and finally liberate all those countries overrun by fascist aggression. for supporting fascism. The twin monster of Hitler and Mussolini came to destroy them, resulting in the Second European World War. All of Europe was decimated. Judgment too came down on Italy. Floods, earthquake came. The end came for the Pope and Mussolini. Here is the world's news in pictures. And this is Pathé Gazette screening it. With the macabre scenes in Milan, where the bodies of Benito Mussolini, his fascist accomplices, and his mistress, Clara Fattacci, were kicked and spat upon by a seething crowd. From Milan, Mussolini began the march on Rome, which lifted him to power. In the same city, his story ended in this frenzied crescendo of hate and degradation his body hanging from the roof of a petrol station. Our second royal visitor is Imperial Majesty Haile Selassie, Emperor of Ethiopia, Rastafari, Lyra Tudor, and King of Kings. Trinidad and Tobago is honored to receive this distinguished personage. Descendants of the Queen of Sheba and King Solomon of Jerusalem,
derived from the same essential beliefs in the nature and the destiny of man. It is thus inevitable too that there should exist between these two great peoples the strong and the lasting ties of friendship and understanding. We all know, as representatives of the people, that this is a particularly critical period in the councils of the 20th century. Sectional and devising factors often cause major obstacles to national development in their expanded sense, as narrow national and ideological interests may threaten even national unity and the progress. No one today is so foolish to believe that any one nation constitutes a perfect model of faith and ideology, nor could any one wish that there should be such utter unity of thought and aspiration. The systems of government which have sought to impose uniformity of belief have survived briefly and have then expired, blind and weakened by excessive reliance upon the supposed infallibility. The only system of government which can survive is one which is prepared to tolerate essential criticism and which accepts this as useful and in any case inevitable aspects of all social and political relations. The tolerance of dissension criticism within the government proceeds from a singular social phrase that the government exists to serve the people generally. The representatives of peoples and nations can only come together with open and objective minds and a willing hearts to engage in dialogue without rigid dogmas and slogans and without violence. Working this way achieves no instant utopia. It may, however, enable us to achieve together what it is possible to achieve and to move forward steadily, if not always in great haste, with some degree of harmony and a mutual understanding. Domestically, we can build strong and happy and resourceful societies. Internationally, we can force the end of oppression of man by man and nation by nation. We can bring about peace security and a mutual trust which will open the way to the greater human achievement for which the needs of mankind now cry out. Distinguished members of Parliament, permit me to take this opportunity to express my heartfelt gratitude for the reception that was accorded me by the people of Trinidad and by the government and Tobago, which we are going to include in our visit. I hope it serve as an example for strengthening relations among nations that are dedicated to the same essential voice. Thank you. After the Emperor's call for tolerance and unity, some of our standing leaders of the society and their wives were presented.
by the driving rain, a sea of faces awaited at the Palisados airport the arrival of a living legend. For some, he was the king of kings, the lion of Judah, even a god. But to most, he was a mild-mannered monarch who had won the respect and admiration of Jamaicans. The air was charged with excitement as anxious, expectant faces searched the skies for the first glimpse of the great silver bird that would bring their hero to Jamaican soil for the first time. Members of a local cult, the Rastafarians, who are easily distinguished by their long beards and unshorn locks, and who worship this figure as a deity, were present in full force. boisterous, tumultuous welcome ever given to any visiting or local celebrity, His Imperial Majesty Haile Selassie I, Emperor of Ethiopia, arrived. The crowd erupted into a frenzy of rejoicing as they broke through the lines of soldiers and police and surged out onto the tarmac, eager to engulf the Emperor with their affection. welcome that was planned had to be abandoned as the avalanche of men, women and children swept away all semblance of order. Ethiopia. A monarchy on the eastern side of Africa has been governed since 1930 by Haile Selassie, whom history records as being a direct descendant of King Solomon and the Queen of Sheba. Jamaica was among the places visited by His Imperial Majesty on his tour of the Caribbean area. Huge crowds jostled for choice vantage points all along the route in the hope of seeing the Emperor. George VI Park, thousands also awaited his arrival. Cenotaph, His Imperial Majesty laid a wreath in memory of Jamaicans who gave their lives in both world wars. The 
tomb of the noted Jamaican patriot Marcus Garvey was also visited by the emperor. The royal party next drove to Jamaica House, the official residence of the Prime Minister, the Right Honourable Sir Alexander Bustamante. The Emperor was introduced to Sir Alexander and Lady Bustamante by the acting Prime Minister, the Honourable Donald Sangster. The National Stadium was the scene of the civic welcome extended by the government of Jamaica to His Imperial Majesty. Prime Minister read the address of welcome. Your Imperial Majesty, I have the great honor to express to you, on behalf of the government and people of Jamaica, a most warm and sincere welcome. This, your first visit to Jamaica, is for us, Your Majesty, a most important and significant event. We have long hoped for this occasion, and your presence with us today is assuredly, Your Majesty, a high point in our history. Mr. Eustace Byrd, one of the two KSAC commissioners, presented the keys of the city to the Emperor. His Imperial Majesty and his party were treated to displays staged by the military and young schoolgirls. The next stop for the royal party was King's House, the official residence of His Excellency the Governor General, Sir Clifford Campbell. His Imperial Majesty was introduced to many dignitaries and members of the Rastafarian cult in full regalia. presented gold medallions to the Rastafarians. Then it was our turn for gift giving. At a formal reception at King's House, the government of Jamaica presented gifts to the emperor and to his grandchildren who accompanied him on the tour. Flanked by officials of state and the military, he was escorted across the lawns of King's House. There, on a balcony, he settled back to enjoy a Jamaican concert under the stars.
sounding brass and clashing cymbals of massed bands heralded the opening of another session of Parliament at Gordon House. This session would be addressed by His Imperial Majesty. He was escorted to the saluting days for the playing of the national anthems of Ethiopia and Jamaica. He was then ushered into the council chamber. The Emperor's address to the assembly and people of Jamaica was in his native Amharic and was translated by a member of his party. I had always wished to come and visit Jamaica. Now, thank God, this wish of mine has been fulfilled. Upon arrival to Jamaica, I have seen more than I had expected. I have seen the progress of the people, and I have seen their determination to march forward in unity towards greater progress. I have also witnessed personally the extent of the feeling of the Jamaican people to the Ethiopian people. Again, I wish to take this opportunity of expressing my thanks to the government and people of Jamaica for the fraternal reception that was accorded to me. Among the academic institutions visited by His Imperial Majesty were Jamaica College, the College of Arts, Science and Technology, and Myco College. And here at Myco College, one of Jamaica's oldest teacher training institutions, he was met by the principal, Mr. Glenn Owen. Escorted inside, he was invited to sign the visitor's book. and a gift was presented to him by one of the pupils. The University of the West Indies is one of the institutions of which Jamaicans are justly proud. It covers 650 sprawling acres at the foot of the Long Mountains in St. Andrew, and it has recently been granted full independent status by the University of London. Members of the faculty, student body, and prominent citizens gathered to witness the ceremony in which the honorary degree of Doctor of Laws would be conferred on His Imperial Majesty. Philip Sherlock, Vice-Chancellor of the University, conferred the degree. The Emperor's reception for the Governor-General and people of Jamaica was held at the Sheraton Kingston Hotel. The atmosphere was cheerful and informal as Jamaicans from all walks of life chatted and joked together and raised friendly glasses in a toast to the continued health and happiness of His Imperial Majesty. As a personal gift, the Emperor entrusted to the government the funds to erect a school. At the chosen site on Payne Avenue, Hundreds gathered to witness the stone-laying ceremony. In appreciation of the Emperor's generosity, the government decided to offer a scholarship to an Ethiopian student tenable at the University of the West Indies. 
The foundation stone was laid by the emperor himself. Come to conquer in the God of Judah. Chanting, placard-bearing Rastafarians swarmed all over the Kingston Railway Station as they awaited the arrival of the Emperor. This was the beginning of a journey by rail across the island to Montego Bay Airport, from which the Emperor and his party would depart. The train stopped briefly at Spanish Town, but the vast multitude, carried away by emotion and enthusiasm, broke out in a wild free-for-all in which several persons were injured. the emperor was treated to glimpses of the Jamaican scenery. His imperial majesty made several stops at various towns along the route. Some of these included Denby, Williamsfield, Magatee, and Montpelier. There he met both prominent citizens and humble folk. He also saw something of our rich heritage of folk dancing. and lanes and carpeted the rooftops. Many of them were Rastafarians who had come from all over the island to catch a final glimpse of the Lion of Judah. Sighted, there went up a roar like the voice of 10,000 lions. <laughs> At Montego Bay Airport, His Imperial Majesty was given the military honors that were thwarted on his arrival at the Palisados Airport by the overzealous welcome. Here, strong detachments of soldiers and police kept the huge crowds at bay.
The time had come for us to say goodbye. The Emperor had spent three days with us, yet it seemed but a few fleeting moments. Haile Selassie, Emperor of Ethiopia, descendant of Solomon and Sheba, had touched the heartstrings of Jamaica as no other stranger had done. He had generated a tidal wave of emotion that had swept the length and breadth of our island and engulfed people with an enthusiasm and affection never before witnessed in the history of Jamaica. London Airport welcomes the return of a visitor who is a part of British history. His Imperial Majesty Haile Selassie, Emperor of Ethiopia, ruler of the oldest Christian kingdom in the world. The Emperor is greeted by Lord Mowbray, the special representative of the Queen. His Imperial Majesty is on a private visit as a personal guest of the Queen. A visit which will bring even closer the royal houses of Ethiopia and Britain. The Imperial Party now drives off first to London and then to Windsor, where the Emperor will stay three days with the Queen. Next, Downing Street, for a courtesy visit to the Prime Minister, Mr. Edward Heath. Crowds gather to watch as the cavalcade draws up at the most famous address in England. After entering number 10, His Majesty is warmly greeted by Mr. Heath. The meeting of the two men was a friendly and cordial one, which went to strengthen even further the ties of friendship between the two countries. Later on, the cavalcade drives down to the Royal Military Academy at Sandhurst. Here, the Emperor is received by Major General Jack Harmon, the Commandant. The Academy was founded in 1799 and has been a training centre for British officers ever since. His Imperial Majesty was first invited to inspect the Guard of Honour, specially paraded for him. This is a wonderful occasion for His Majesty, since one of the guard is his grandson, 20-year-old Prince David McConnell, who is undergoing military training here. Training at Sandhurst is hard, but students come here from all over the world to become masters of their profession. The Emperor has a very keen eye for smartness, especially at a march past. From academy to college. This time, the Berkshire College of Agriculture is honored by a visit from the Emperor. the royal signature. His Imperial Majesty was shown round by the principal of the college, Mr. Pollard. These greenhouses are very extensive, and here horticultural students are trained in the technical and practical side of their education.
there's a great variety of things to be seen, and little escapes the notice of the emperor. The laboratories, of course, are new, but the original grounds were laid out nearly 250 years ago. The emperor has a great knowledge of animal husbandry. Because of its wool industry, Ethiopia keeps up to date with the most modern methods of breeding and rearing sheep, as well as cows. The Berkshire College of Agriculture is one of the most advanced of its type in the country and teaches many hundreds of British and overseas students every year. However, farming is not just animals. In machinery too, the industry must always look ahead. The latest in combine harvesters. But perhaps the highlight of the visit was the garter ceremony at Windsor Castle, where three new knights were installed. The garter is Britain's oldest and most esteemed order of chivalry, and was founded by Edward III in 1347. To be created a member is one of the greatest honors the Queen can bestow. The Emperor of Ethiopia has been a Knight of the Order since 1954, in a category specially reserved for non-British royalty. Here he's accompanied by Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother. the Queen and Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh. These are the warders of the Tower of London, known as the Beef Eaters. The procession of the knights through the castle is one of the most glittering spectacles of the year. Royal Highness Prince Charles, on leave from the Royal Navy. Although already a Knight of the Garter, this was the Emperor's first personal appearance at the ceremony. Also present was the Queen's uncle, Earl Mountbatten. The ceremony over, the knights leave St. George's Chapel, seen recently of the lying in state of His Royal Highness, the Duke of Windsor. While the knights in their ancient regalia line the steps, the Emperor of Ethiopia and the Queen Mother descend. Followed by the Queen of England with her husband, Prince Philip. Down the steps of St. George's go the royal party, ready to be taken by carriage back to the State Apartments. His Imperial Majesty has always had great affection for Britain and the royal family. He has been to Britain on many occasions since his first stay back in 1934. Ethiopia and Britain are many thousands of miles apart. As the guest of the Queen has brought the two countries even closer together than before.
ወዳጆች ታራሪ ብርሃነ መስቀል ደስታ የላስታ ወራጃ ገዢ ወዳጆችን የሆኑ መስተርስዊን ከባለቤታቸው ጋር ታሪካዊ የሆነውን የላስታ ግዛት ውስጥ የሚገኘውን ላሊበላ ቤተክርስቲያን ለመጎብኘት መጣውልና በተለመደው ደግነትህ በሚቻልህ ረድተህ አስተናግደህ እንድትሸኛቸው ተስፋ በማድረግ ወዳንተ ልከናቸዋል እንግዲህ ያደረክላቸውን አቀባበል ሲመለሱ እንዲያስረዱን እንጠብቃለን ደህና ወዳጆች ታራሪ ብርሃነ መስቀል ደስታ የላስታ ወራጃ ገዢ ወዳጆችን የሆኑ መስተርስዊን ከባለቤታቸው ጋር ታሪካዊ የሆነውን የላስታ ግዛት ውስጥ የሚገኘውን ላሊበላ ቤተክርስቲያን ለመጎብኘት መጣውልና በተለመደው ደግነትህ በሚቻልህ ረድተህ አስተናግደህ እንድትሸኛቸው ተስፋ በማድረግ ወዳንተ ልከናቸዋል እንግዲህ ያደረክላቸውን አቀባበል ሲመለሱ እንዲያስረዱን እንጠብቃለን ወዳጆች ታራሪ ብርሃነ መስቀል ደስታ የላስታ ወራጃ ገዢ ወዳጆችን የሆኑ መስተርስዊን ከባለቤታቸው ጋር ታሪካዊ የሆነውን የላስታ ግዛት ውስጥ የሚገኘውን ላሊበላ ቤተክርስቲያን ለመጎብኘት መጣውልና በተለመደው ደግነትህ በሚቻልህ ረድተህ አስተናግደህ እንድትሸኛቸው ተስፋ በማድረግ ወዳንተ ልከናቸዋል እንግዲህ ያደረክላቸውን አቀባበል ሲመለሱ እንዲያስረዱን እንጠብቃለን ደህና ወዳጆች ታራሪ ብርሃነ መስቀል ደስታ የላስታ ወራጃ ገዢ ወዳጆችን የሆኑ መስተርስዊን ከባለቤታቸው ጋር ታሪካዊ የሆነውን የላስታ ግዛት ውስጥ የሚገኘውን ላሊበላ ቤተክርስቲያን ለመጎብኘት መጣውለት
these things are true things. You don't see? And society fails to realize these things and don't want to bow to this rock. And this man is the king. Rastafari, without many apologies. I personally don't make no apologies. As the Almighty God. If you don't understand what I mean, I mean, He is the God. Ed, Romans book 1. Right? He is the Trinity. He is the transformer of all things that have life. We are a divine people which, which kept up a divine theocratic government through earth and that government should be from Cape to Cairo. Every man should bow and stand up within such government by the right government. We should administrate by a priestly order, seeing that is pure righteousness. So this is the righteous government that shall dominate the earth within our early when all the evil shall turn and leave out of the earth or burn out of creation. And this government, which will be set upon creation, ruled by the kings of kings, lord of lords, conquer, elect of himself, and the light of this world, our divine mercy, So my king is man, despise me for that, you know. I personally think by not making no apology, take off my head. Babylon, me I tell the Pope in person who represents the devil, I know I make no apology. I know that Pope, the Vatican represents the devil, and the King of Kings represents Christ, the Almighty God, the All Powerful, the Lion of Judah, Rastafari, no apology. King Alpha, without him, without beginning of days, not end of time. How can society cut out this spiritual concept within us? It is a spiritual birth with no highest victory. The place where you dig up black man from, carry him back there, can him come like Guinea a bit. If you not put him down, the cast cast now go, it's just so hurt about going on. And it's going harder to tell when the king ready to take over. So I'm not going to beg man, say, if you do this, I have a vote for him, I have to do that. When he's ready, everything at the move, we not at the right, you know. They have to send we. We not begging for the send we. We not begging for our society to send we. We have sufficient faith within us, what society can't see. It is hope you are for those at home and those abroad. abroad. Well, this is the time now where you hear, say, you hear about Moses and here and go to fear all the while and tell him, say, well, if you release the children of Israel, and he won't do it. Well, at the time, you know, we are dealing with you now. All the tell, we are telling Babylon, say, well, I saw it go. He might underrate we, and so we're not going on a big school. And where we come from, and who we is, we show you how the people are spiritually blind and educated through society. And it, unless you dig out the root, or whatsoever it is, whether it may be bad or good. If it's bad, you have to dig it out. And if it's good, you have to set it up for the society becomes good. So if we are the bad people within society, they have to get weed away by dig out the road. And the only root them can dig out is Rastafari, which is Christ that the king in whom God live, and we know that without any apology, we now ask that is the black man to Rasta me a deal with. Rasta me a deal with. Rastafari pick me a deal with. Brethren of Rastafari faith, who realize them king, who respect them king. So to them king, them now go, they go do nothing that is disrespectful. But the man who don't respect him king, to respect himself, when we go, they go do anything. Anything, he will do anything. For when day is done and freedom is done and serfdom song is we shall overcome. Organize poverty, family disunity. What a price we have paid. For this and made slave trade. For when day is done and justice has failed, and we end up having a city of two tails, organized 
centralize and constructively criticize. Church and state must have debate and then set the record straight. For when day is done and equality has to be bought and we find it very difficult to live what life has taught. Let freedom, justice, and equality will ensure us continuous sovereignty. Then our labor's efforts will become national, and our national efforts will become social. It be you and me feeling free, plant the tree. Land a moss, food surplus, life is real to the feel. For when day is done, we must be able to say that we have overcome. We must be able to say that we have overcome.